Um, hello everyone, welcome to our session tonight on water in the city. My name is Paul Reynolds, I'm a chartered landscape architect and urban designer and a director at the Landscape and Urban Planning Practice Tapestry. I'm also Honorary Secretary of the Urban Design Group and a committee member of the London Institute, sorry, the Landscape Institute London branch, who are the joint hosts of this evening's event. It's an event which I think is very pertinent um, and of interest to both landscape architects and urban designers. We face many challenges in adapting and designing our towns and cities to deal with the impacts of climate change and perhaps dealing with the increased frequency and ferocity of rainfall events is one of the greatest challenges that we face. So tonight we have an array of international speakers looking at what is being done here in the UK as well as talking to us about some examples of international best practice. To do this we're joined by speakers including Louise Walker project manager focusing on SUDS for Syria, Construction Industry Research and Information Association, who will be talking a bit about current UK SUDS landscape. Louise will be followed by a pre-recorded presentation from Peter Mackey, director in Chapman Taylor's Shanghai office about some of their sponge city work in China. Unfortunately, the time zone difference means that Peter can't join us in person. Our third speaker will then be Ian Lanchbury, a landscape architect at Rambol, who's going to be telling us about their cloudburst master planning work. And then we're going to head, hopefully, live to Australia to hear from Owen Richards from McGregor Coxall, who will be talking to us about their work on sponge cities and suds. We'll end up back here in the UK with Zach Tudor and Roger Noel from Sheffield City Council, who will be telling us about their work and how they're dealing with suds issues and implementing schemes from a lead local flood authority perspective. My task tonight is to try and keep all this running to schedule and hopefully at the end we're going to have some time for some Q&A with our speakers. So if you've got any thoughts, comments, questions, please do put them in the chat and Q&A boxes. We normally have sort of fantastic response and people will have a good chat going throughout the presentation. So um, please do keep up with that. And that's, I think, pretty much enough for me for now. Just to say we are recording the event tonight and it will be put up on the website in a couple of weeks for friends and um, colleagues who aren't able to join us this evening. And also just to say, if everyone could stay on mute for the majority of the event, if you have a question and you particularly want to ask it, I may come to you at the end if we have time to let you ask your own question or if I ask a question on your behalf and completely misunderstand the point you're trying to make, feel free to, to jump in and tell me. But without further ado, I will now hand over to Louise to kick us off. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Okay, can everybody see the presentation okay? Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you. So, um, thanks for the introduction, Paul, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Louise Walker, I'm project manager with um, Syria, which is the Construction in Industry Research and Information Association. I'm going to talk to you tonight a little bit about Syria, um, one of our initiatives, Sustrain, and a project which is called BEST. And then I'll go on to talk about uh, planning and urban water management, the opportunities to input to change for the better, the importance of master planning for SUDS, and the importance of retrofitting SUDS as well, as well some good practice examples, and then in ensuring future good practice and uptake. So Syria um, is a small company founded in 1960, so not-for-profit member-based organisation. Um, we produce lots of guidance and training, including the SUDS manual, which has become a very trusted document um, in the construction and implementation of SUDS. We work across sectors, interdisciplinary, and we have um, the themes that are listed there. Uh, Louise, sorry, it's Paul. Just to say, you we've got your presenter view. Are you able to make it? Oh, sorry. That's right. <clears throat> Just make it a bit larger for people to see. Is that better? Um, no, still seeing it. The presenter view mode. Hmm. I just swap them. <laughs> I swap them back. Is that not? Um... No, it's still presents you. Don't worry, just carry on. That oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, okay, so Sustrain and BEST. Uh, Sustrain is a community for SUDS professionals. Uh, we have a website, um, sustrain.org. Um, we provide training. We have um, over 100 case studies available on the website. Um, and we uh, try and enable practitioners to confidently deliver good practice in SUDS. We celebrate SUDS champions. We have SUDS awards every other year and a SUDS champion award every year. It's a SUDS champion award this year. And they, these awards recognize that very often a good SUDS scheme is led by a strong individual with the ability to inspire, inform and influence great SUDS. Um, one of our projects is to develop the benefits estimation tool. So this uh, if, helps to evaluate the benefits, the multiple benefits of blue and green infrastructure. It's, um, it's a spreadsheet tool at the moment, but we're halfway through a project to take that into the GIS format, which will hopefully make it a lot easier to use. And we're hoping to uh, launch that in the autumn of this year. So I said, I, I work in the urban water management area. Um, or sustainable water management area of SUDS. Within that is urban water management covering um, lots of different aspects of water management. So let's we'll talk about SUDS in the UK. So SUDS design principles, um, looking at surface water as an opportunity, managing it um, as close to the surface, close to its source as possible thinking about splitting into sub catchments and connecting SUDS components together in a management train. And um, in delivering SUDS, we think about the four pillars of SUDS. So delivering um, water quantity, um, managing water quantity, um, improving water quality, delivering amenity, and creating um, potential for increased biodiversity. Um, this is what makes a good SUDS scheme that incorporates these four pillars. But there are multiple benefits that SUDS can deliver, and uh, we try and recognize all of these. So things like improving um, thermal comfort, providing um, Opportunities to improve health and well-being, enhancing the quality of urban space, managing air quality. So really, um, incorporation of suds in urban areas can help make better places. And we're facing a lot of problems at the moment, which we all recognise. Um, in addition to flood, uh, we also have to think about drought in this country. Um, currently, we are thinking very carefully about how we use our green spaces and we recognise the need for people to be able to access those green spaces safely. Um, we're also thinking about water quality and the reduction in biodiversity. And all these things are current and pressing um, considerations. There's lots of drivers for SUDS to help to provide multiple benefits, and these are recognised in government policy. Um, and my colleague just uh, recently did a, a summary of this, um, where amenity, biodiversity, climate resilience, adaptation, water quality management and flood risk management are mentioned in um, English government policy. Um, these are quite well recognised in Wales and Scotland. And also, but there is an acknowledged input to managing um, flood risk and tackling climate change. So currently there is um, a consultation which is open on the National Planning Policy Framework and the National Model Design Code and that consultation is open until the 27th of this month. Um, there's also a planning white paper which has been informed by work done by the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. And there's work going on to update the manual for streets. Um, and all these have um, can have an impact on the how SUDs are delivered. So um, responding to the consultation is important 
if we want SUDS to be included in these things. So I'll just go through a few good practice examples. So this is one of the older SUDS schemes that, that we often refer to. Um, it's a SUDS scheme with a management train. It's been monitored for a number of years um, and compared to a control site. And it's done very well in terms of improving water quality, managing water quantity, providing biodiversity and being well accepted by the community. It's a medium density housing development with 35 dwellings per hectare. Um, it's a retrofit site the, in that the layout was already agreed and the SUD scheme had to fit around that. Um, and it, but it's one of the most comprehensive um, suites of monitoring SUDs in the UK. Um, another site that has been recognised as good practice SUDs was an award winner at the SUDs Awards in 2020, and this was this is Bertha Park in Scotland. And this was recommend, uh, recognised for its integration of SUDs from the master planning stage. A lot of thought went into achieving water quality, biodiversity and amenity benefits, as well as effective surface water drainage. There's a network of SUDs permeating through the master plan and infiltration at, at, plot site, at plot level into underlying sands and gravels and permeable pavi paving's been used, road drainage um, drains into swales and filter drains and surface water enters into a main pond, which is a centerpiece of the development. Um, the uh, landscape and biodiversity management plan was prepared also at master planning stage to inform the establishment and long term maintenance of the blue and green infrastructure, which is very important. Um, I think adoption is one of the main um, uh, barriers to the uptake of SUDS. SUDS so shouldn't be just, there's a lot of guidance. Um, including that produced by Syria, but also lots of guidance produced locally um, in how to, um, to deliver SUDS with good practice. Problems occur when this isn't followed. And for example, at construction, say, at constru construction stage, when the effects of um, maybe less than good practice isn't known on, on what will happen to the SUDS, um, such as blocking the drainage with, with construction rubble. Uh, so, what makes a what makes a bad suds scheme generally not beautiful, too steep, deep water, too much concrete, um, no thought going into how they can be maintained um, easily and safely, not integrated with the highway lay, layout early on. So, um, and up with a kind of bomb crater at the side at the edge of the development which is not providing any amenity value but I don't want to dwell on um, poor practice we want to talk about good practice and it's not just about new developments um, there's a lot of good practice in retrofit suds as well and this is where we, we are seeing um, most of the good practice at the moment we're having more um, challenges in getting uh, good practice suds within new developments this was the overall um, award winner of the SUDS Awards 2020, and, and it's a scheme in South Wales and Greener Grange Town. Um, it was originally uh, conceived to try and remove, remove the need to pump a lot of surface water um, through the combined sewer system um, over eight miles of sewage. And the area was retrofit with over 100 um, rain gardens, including street trees. Um, it covers 12 Victorian streets and 550 properties. Um, in 2019, and there was an assessment done on the wider benefits of the project. Um, partly using the best tool that I mentioned before, the, the uh, spreadsheet version of it. And this demonstrated um, a, a financial um, benefits of the project um, estimated to be 8.4 million over a 30 year period. 
So it suggests a maximum payback period of around 12 and a half years. Um, and there's lots of community engagement going on, as you can see in um, implementation of these sub schemes, and it really improves the area. It includes all those things, um, cycleways and traffic management. So there are other things that can be done alongside implementing the SUDs themselves in an area. Um, other examples of good practice. Um, in London, uh, the strategic SUDs pilot study was carried out. Um, over 200,000 properties are thought to be at risk from surface water flooding in London. Um, and uh, some modelling was done to work out how much uh, these uh, properties in three boroughs could benefit from um, widespread implementation of SUDS. Um, and again, BEST was used to uh, evaluate the socio-economic benefits and they were found to outstrip the flooding benefits and natural capital benefits. Um, by an order of magnitude for some of the scenarios that were evaluated. And it, it's demonstrated the underlying holistic value of strategically dispersed SUDs to urban communities. Um, so flood mitigation in, in itself generates significant case, to, case for investment, um, but can also be a secondary factor. Um, a number of well-cited SUDs interventions can add up to catchment scale intervention and can could provide a very strong business case and the assistant director for environment and energy with the greater london authority commented that wide-scale delivery of these measures will undoubtedly play a very valuable role in london's green recovery so in uh, helping to ensure future good practice and future uptake um, of SUDS. We've also been working with the Greater London Authority um, on, on producing um, good practice guidance for different sectors. Um, so this is thinking about thinking strongly about how we can um, use SUDS within the different sectors. So schools, social housing, parks and green spaces, hospitals, retail and office sector, and recognising that they all have their own particular challenges and opportunities for um, using SUDS. And uh, there's a link there to those guide, those sets of guidance. So we, we know that SUDS clearly help to deliver beautiful places, biodiversity net gain, flood risk management, and improve water quality, as well as many other benefits. A stronger regulatory support for SUDS is needed in England. And there is, there is an opportunity, which is open until the 27th of this month to make sure SUDS are included in planning. So I urge people to have a look at the consultation um, and see where SUDS can be made um, a stronger, stronger on the agenda. Um, thank you for listening. As I mentioned, it's SUDS, SUDS champion this year. So if you know of any, um, if anyone knows of any one who should be nominated, please, please do go to our Sustrain um, page. And um, I'm pleased to say that we'll be hearing from our, some of our SUDS awards winners later on this evening as well. So that's me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Louise. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> I think it was a great introduction to um, hopefully what we'll be seeing for the rest of the evening. Right. I will move us on to Peter's presentation from Chapman Taylor. Now, this, as I mentioned earlier, is a pre-recorded video. So I'm going to try and share this on my screen. And hopefully this is going to work. Um, let me double check. Right, I hope everyone can see that. I apologise in advance. The sound is a little bit echoey, um, but hopefully it won't be too bad. So give me a shout if this doesn't work. Hello, thanks for inviting us today to this event. I don't know why she's gone green. 
try that again. Okay. Hello, thanks for inviting us today to this event. Uh, we are Chapman Taylor, Shanghai Studio. I'm Peter Mackey, I'm one of the directors here. I'm with our Associate Director for Master Planning and our resident expert from City, Yichun Shu. So, the first question really, let's start by saying what is Fun City? Uh, the, the definitions are a little bit murky. The best one that we come up with is that the city literally acts like a sponge, i.e. it operates with good flexibility in adapting to environmental changes, namely mitigating the potential natural disasters caused by excessive and sometimes minimal rainfall. It's also known as a resilient city strategy. So how has smart uh, how has sponge city been applied to Chinese master plans, specifically by us and Chapman Taylor? We've broken this down into three kind of separate little elements to look at, river, lake, and ocean. So starting with river, what we're looking at here is a, a mass plan we're very proud of. This is the Shangzhan area of Shangan. We won this competition uh, towards the end of 2018, and it encapsulates a lot of the principles of Sponge City, and particularly uh, Sponge City acting through a river system. We respected the existing water system, in fact, built on it. Chang'an is in southern Hebei, uh, where surface water is quite scarce. So it's quite an important and valuable uh, feature, hydrologically uh, and culturally. Uh, we tried to create parks that went deep into our built environment. And these parks were always served by the surface water of a river. And as you can see, moving through the site, east to west, we have this large, I think it's a kilometer wide, um, rain flood corridor. Now this corridor only floods, uh, it's anticipated once every 100 years, but we needed to move people across to connect the two parts uh, of our area and we also wanted to make it a major leisure uh, component so again the surface water the language of the rivers uh, was brought through using sponge city techniques and different techniques within that kind of urban semi-urban environment so things like a sponge linear park where water is collected in small urban blocks uh, and used as a recreational feature uh, and as a reservoir on some occasions. Curbside rain gardens where we collect, percolate and store rainwater for future use using uh, linear uh, elements along the roadside. And then also permeable pavements where the actual hard landscaping allows for rainwater when it does fall to be percolated through and stored. And at the bottom three are showing how these three were detailed strategy applied in the city level um, in the mass plan and uh, how these are connected and uh, what is the system, what is linkage between them. Thanks. Uh, slightly larger systems, uh, we call these uh, island hill storage. Uh, again, this is a man-made mound, which is a perhaps a significant part of a pocket park, but it's also a significant device for saving, storing and reusing uh, valuable water. We also have this system sometimes connected to surface water as a kind of spring overflow so that uh, the water is there as an attractive uh, feature in the urban parks. Similarly, uh, we look at how the water can be brought to rivers through falling off uh, the built form. So phytoremediation 
uh, is a technique where metals and other pollutants are removed from the water effectively in a um, porous uh, charcoal system or sometimes uh, surface reed beds. So it's all about recycling storm water, cleansing it and getting it back into the river system. And again, the bottom three are showing the location of them. And uh, um, you can see how gray water are collected from the ecological area and the urban development area. And then a uh, sort of combination showing how precipitation, i.e. rainfall, sometimes snow in Herbay, uh, either comes through the green parts of the city, uh, through park water collection, or through the harder uh, built and hard landscape forms of the city, through urban water collection, uh, collected into and added to by the municipal water system, and then through eventually the flooding corridors. And in this particular case, it went all the way to Bayang Lake, which is one of the central features of the new Shanghai city. So that was rivers. Uh, lakes, obviously a larger mass of water, therefore potentially a greater reservoir for collecting the sponge city strategy. What you're looking at here is again uh, a, a winning scheme. This is Chongqing Liangjiang Innovative Community. It was very important in this particular instance that we had a very strong ecology in the centre of the scheme. So we built a whole leisure and recreational uh, schedule around our newly formed Sponge City Lake. This slide is kind of demonstrating how the urban construction uh, contributes to bringing water down from height to, of course, the lowest point, which is where our lake is. So various forms of um, mechanical, of civil and natural um, water for down to the lowest level. This is more a model showing how the water moves down through um, ecology. That ecology could be managed parks, it could be woodland, there was a significant woodland component on these leeward slopes, it could be comparative uh, wilderness. But again, it's about creating collecting pools mid-slope. It's about offering um, percolation down through to at least the groundwater level and then finding uh, the lake at the lowest levels. And this shows what we're calling a sponge corridor model. We did have a lot of streets that were running, if you like, horizontally at the same contour level and where we have these flat areas we wanted to create a attractive landscape feature but also a system that was actually taking the water holding it at a level percolating some down for storage in the drier seasons and then allowing the water to continue down to the lake finally of the three water types of course the biggest water masses on the planet are the oceans. Um, and oceans come with their own unique problems when one is considering Sponge City. Uh, what you're looking at here is a project in Shenzhen, this is Da Peng, and the beach that was the center of the master plan project had suffered terrible damage from a typhoon, uh, number 10, that had hit directly a couple of years uh, before the project. So really, it was very clear that our master planning work that we did with Mark Schwartz had to address and really had to mitigate the potential problems of typhoon. And actually, that's not just the storm surges of the sea, it's also the flood surges as the rainfall falls off the mountains and down towards this beach. So we employed five levels of uh, sponge city defense 
to mitigate against flood, to mitigate against typhoon. And these five elements were actually the basis also of our master plan design. Level one was the sea barrier. Uh, we suggested floating uh, landscaped vegetation barriers. These were there to actually calm and tamper the size of the tidal waves as the storm built and therefore to some extent offset the damage to the beach. The second level of defence was coastal dikes. This of course is creating a vertical barrier to stop the waves getting too far inland. As you can see on the right, we offered many options for how these uh, dikes can actually become strong landscape and leisure elements on the beach. The third level of protection as we move inland was an eco park. So we needed to create a, a wetland, a wetland which could cope with both salt water and fresh water, depending on where the, uh, the excess water was coming from, uh, and be an attractive feature which drew tourists, but of course mitigated and dealt with excess uh, water amounts. The fourth barrier, the fourth element, was an inland dike, so a second vertical element to prevent storm surge getting towards the fields and the villages. Uh, again, designed as an attractive addition to the tourist landscape experience. And then finally, sponge ponds. We actually tried to reuse some of the derelict shrimp farms uh, that had been on the plains uh, of this area to create, again, attractive features uh, that tourists could enjoy. And that would be the final layer of defence from flood water. This is a good uh, couple of slides. This, of course, is sometimes how the beach at Darkon would look. And the next slide is how it looks when most people are using it and how we would like to keep the integrity uh, of the space for those users from Shenzhen. So, how do we weave sponge cities uh, into other trends in master plans in China? First one is vertical city. So, in a vertical city, what you're looking at here is a project we did in Chengdu, Qilong, and vertical greenery does not just mean what it literally says, whilst we have used uh, vertical walls with greenery on, we're talking about moving greenery to different heights, uh, different parts of the buildings vertically. So, Chilong, we stress the idea of roof gardens and green terraces throughout the, the towers of the residential on the right and uh, the offices on the left. These would, of course, absorb rainwater. These would create a biophilic environment for the office users and the residents to enjoy. Uh, and, of course, would be involved in the phyto remediation process. 15 minute circle. Uh, it's a 15 minutes living circle to try to uh, diversify people's daily. Uh, needs, monthly needs, or uh, like weekly needs to make everything uh, very mixed use. So we're, um, when it applies to the sponge city in, uh, related to the landscape, uh, we're uh, designed multiple levels of, from the smaller scale to bigger scale, different kinds, different functions, landscape related, ecological related parks or playgrounds or like a greenland to facilitate people's uh, needs. As, as you, you can see, the Sponge City is a, a very sustainable strategy. Uh, it's all about the hydrology and the ecology. Uh, the 15 minute circle also is a very prevalent, uh, sustainably driven 
strategy in our master planning in China to minimize uh, transport, private certainly, even public, uh, around the cities. So the idea is that within these 15 minute circles, you are never more than 300 meters away from a significant um, piece of, of greenery. And those greeneries, as is demonstrated on the right of the slide, often will contain water features as well, which are components of the sponge city strategy. Smart city uh, is another phrase that's banded around often, and it's, it's important. In terms of sponge city, we think that, that smart city can be combined so that you have real time monitoring and adjusting of water levels uh, and technologies to obviously keep uh, everything running smoothly irrigation wise. And the Xiongan is like implementing the smart city um, very widely in their new design. Um, so like, uh, for instance, they have for each trees there, they have a specific ID and this ID linked to their digital uh, city and uh, monitoring the uh, health and wellness of the whole area. Wow. Yeah. Um, this is a slide that we uh, very proud of, we use this quite often, and of course it's about flood resistance, which is I think the key fundamental element of Sponge City, especially in China, in the southern areas which are tropical and subtropical, so there are uh, significant storm events, uh, especially in the summer. So we try to imagine public spaces which in the drier, sunnier days still have a water components such as the top slide and then in rainy days they are still usable uh, they can still be enjoyed but the topography uh, the design elements have allowed for a significant increase in the amount of water that needs to be held and then the bottom uh, image in, in stormy days of course uh, when not so many people will be using the parks um, we need to be able to take even more water and hold it in that particular area so that it does not flood uh, more urban parts of the city. Cultural preservation is also a, a way that we weave Sponge City into our schemes. So, for instance, like uh, when we uh, are designing um, a mass plan in our Place that has a uh, already uh, very uh, dense uh, water network. Um, then we are trying to preserve people's memory of those um, water and to try to keep the lifestyle of how people um, having the re uh, deep relationship with the water. So even we are designing a very modern, more contemporary city, we still make. Um, respect all the water system and also try to keep the memory, keep the lifestyle, uh, but to make it more diversified, more ecological, more uh, um, uh, modern, or more interesting. Yeah. So contemporary interpretations of, let's say, more uh, cultural and historical uh, elements. Of course, where there is water, there will be uh, planting. Hydrology and ecology uh, go hand in hand. So we've been very mindful of that uh, in our master planning work. And then green energy. Uh, this is a scheme that we did, I think, also in Shenzhen, shall we? And uh, we looked at facades, elements, surfaces of the building, as well as of the landscape to place um, elements that could produce energy, PV cells, thermal, uh, which will actually then help feed back into the sponge city strategy, feed back into the smart city strategy, so that the, the ecology uh, of the city could be powered, if you like, uh, by, uh, by the old sort of sun power, etc. So finally, uh, uh, to sort of conclude, we just want to uh, give you a hit list of master plan procedure 
of Sponge City. It all starts with background analysis, then comes the design process. But it's very important within that design process that you use the existing water network as much as possible as a base. Then we think about the different levels of water. And when we say levels, we mean the, the, the types of water, river, lake, ocean, culvert. Um, and we also mean physically the levels. So vertical city uh, strategy. And then finally, it's all about combination. Uh, master planning, sustainability needs a holistic vision to work and Sponge City is an incredibly important part of that holistic vision and therefore must be combined with all the other elements of the master plan design. So I hope, I hope that was helpful. We've been Chapman Taylor and thank you very much for listening. Bye bye. Bye, thank you. Great. Hopefully that was um, interesting. It was good to see some questions cropping up in the chat from people. Um, sorry, I'll restart my video now. Um, I will save those questions for the end. Obviously, unfortunately, um, Peter and his colleague can't be here, but I think um, we'll be hearing a little bit more about Sponge Cities from uh, Owen at McGregor Coxall. So it may be that he can answer some of these queries or even may answer some of them in his presentation later on. But we'll move across now to a bit closer to home and I'll ask Ian if he can share his screen and give us his presentation on the work that Ramble have been doing on cloud-burst master planning. Yep, thank you, Paul. Um, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Okay, great. So I'm a landscape architect at Rambo working in the UK, um, but I'm just going to share today some of the cloudburst work that Rambo has been doing internationally, uh, primarily in the Nordics and also in New York. Um, so I'm going to just talk through a little bit of the context of these studies and then the process through which cloudburst master plans have been developed and the um, nature of the um, projects and how they would develop from inception through to delivery on site and then some questions around their potential application in the UK which probably should feed into the discussion later. Rambol is an international design consultancy whose mission is to create sustainable societies where people and nature flourish um, and having sort of only joined Rambol early last year um, I see the the Cloudburst master planning really is a direct manifestation of that approach and how they sort of bring multiple disciplines together to sort of challenge and resolve um, sort of quite complex technical problems. Um, the Cloudburst master planning work was led by the Rambo Climate Adaptation and Landscape team in the Nordics. And there's quite a bit of information publicly available, but I'm going to just try and briefly talk you through the process and how it's evolved and where it is at now. So for the Copenhagen Cloudburst Master Plan, which was the first one that was undertaken, it initiated way back in 2009 after COP15, which took place in Copenhagen. And through and around that time, there was a national development of uh, standards for climate protections, creation of a climate secretariat, uh, changes to legislation, funding and responsibilities, and uh, some fairly recent extreme weather events. And I think probably many of those things you can see reflected in the UK context now. So we have COP26 uh, in Glasgow later this year. As um, Louise mentioned, there's a range of legislation changes coming forward on environment and drainage. Um, local authorities have declared climate emergencies. And so there's there's a, a quite a few mirrored similarities. And the timeline for Copenhagen was 
a climate plan originally in 2009, some various studies um, for a few years, and then the development of the Cloudburst plan initially in 2012, and then through to design and implementation over the last few years. So Cloudburst is defined as an extreme amount of rain that falls within a short period of time. For Copenhagen and for the, the Cloudburst master plan in Copenhagen, that was defined as a 10 centimeter of water falling on an area within a one in a hundred year storm event. And that might be different um, sort of volumes or events depending on the location, cities or aspirations of a, a master plan. Um, the studies are undertaken on a catchment scale, which is quite an important point because that means there's potential that they overlap with administrative boundaries um, or maybe don't cover cities as a whole, just a, a focus area on um, catchments which provide particular challenges. Um, and the key thing that really drove the process was, although the main aim and the main functional aim of the master plan was to deal with these cloudburst events, from the start, it was important that they considered um, wider benefits um, of green-blue infrastructure in solving um, other local challenges and creating places that are more attractive and livable. And this sort of livable cities wheel that Rambo has developed captures a range of issues that were considered or and are being considered in cloudburst master plans so you've got things like climate adaptation and water on the one hand but then uh, the mobility and um, culture sensitive design on the other so the challenge for the cloudburst master planning for the start was to question whether it was actually possible to achieve a, a greater value than um, traditional stormwater management through investment in blue green infrastructure whether it was possible to reduce the risks of using um, blue-green infrastructure over traditional stormwater management processes, and whether it was possible to increase the cooperation across a range of agencies and stakeholders, um, which was, I think, one of the major challenges in the process. Um, at the start of the process, the idea was that there would be high levels of capital investment in the first sort of 10 to 20 years of developing and delivering interventions and that would be offset in later years by um, reduction in management and maintenance of traditional infrastructure so the cloudburst scenario is illustrated with the green bars in terms of costs over rolling 10-year periods over a 100-year life cycle and then the blue bars illustrate the baseline do nothing scenario, which is of uh, maintaining and upgrading infrastructure to deal with the new climate situation. Master plans are split into three broad stages. So firstly, a literature review, which is both done on a local scale for where the master plan is taking place, but also considering studies and policies internationally. The main body of work for developing the master plan itself, which we're going to this a bit more detail shortly. And then a key part is the delivery of a pilot project shortly after the master plan is completed. And that aims to sort of demonstrate how the principles and processes that are set out in the master plan can be realized on the ground and kind of give some visible manifestation of something happening and kind of garner further support for the project once you can start to demonstrate real gains in the catchment. So for the master plan step, uh, master plan phase, it's generally divided into four steps. First one is around the flood risk and determining the nature of the risk from cloudburst events, both in terms of frequency, but also um, specific locations within the catchment and understanding the, uh, the flow through the catchment as well. Then the planning and design phase, which brings in those other elements of um, placemaking and consideration of uh, socioeconomic issues and the uh, general physical infrastructure of the city and the catchment. Then an iteration process of understanding the benefits of potential measures and their combined effect on the catchment and evaluating that and then kind of going back through the process to develop a, a robust master plan over time. 
So some of the steps in, in this analysis includes um, understanding the catchments. In, so before actually getting into the master plan, determining which catchments are challenging and uh, focusing a study area on those. And then risks on sort of various water sedge, social corridors, um, the terrain of the catchment, risk analysis, and picking up feedback from local residents and stakeholders on how the catchment has responded to cloudburst events in recent times and sort of a, gaining a, a kind of clear view of the situation within the catchment. And again, there's a further analysis on there looking at things beyond the water environment, so the social infrastructure, transport, and the green corridors that exist as well. Then as the master plans are developed, the decision-making process um, looked at a range of options in order to determine which master plan to adapt. And I guess as a do minimum, they all need to meet the requirement for dealing with cloudburst events. But then beyond that, they're scored on kind of how visible the interventions are. So kind of the, the point being that if interventions are more visible and people can see and understand how they're managing water and delivering multifunctionality maybe outweigh another option that's less visible. Um, the feasibility and costs obviously form part of the decision making, but then also the synergy with other initiatives that are taking place within the catchment um, that may not be related to blue-green infrastructure or uh, water management. So for example, cycle and walking improvements and where uh, capital investment can kind of deliver multiple benefits. So this is an example of an early stage um, within the master plan development. So understanding where people value the environment locally and understanding potential flow routes um, and challenge areas. And then understanding how potential measures in different locations could capture certain volumes of water. And the idea is to kind of capture the flow, slow it down, um, but also retain it in a way that maybe adds some immunity and biodiversity. In the Copenhagen study, a uh, toolbox of eight broad typologies were developed um, that were proposed across various stages. So you've got things from uh, park scale interventions to different street typologies, urban canals, urban creeks, retention boulevards and green streets and they were kind of just marked on where those typologies might apply but then in New York cloudburst master plan uh, a different series of typologies were developed and I think this is where maybe the strategic master planning stage works and is applicable across different locations but when you get to this level it's it's where the kind of placemaking comes in and understanding the streetscape and the sense of place will determine how the typologies will be developed and they'll probably be city or catchment specific. Um, and on the New York one, it shows a total of 68 blue-green infrastructure projects. Um, and I guess each one of those is also quite broad, so they're probably a street scale. So in terms of the number of interventions, you're probably looking at many hundreds of um, retrofit interventions proposed through the master plan. And this one also shows where the interventions link in with some of the local walking and cycling proposals as well. So for the pilot project, um, this is the Copenhagen example, just showing how a select, selected area of the master plan was taken forward and developed in a little more detail to kind of help stakeholders or uh, local communities understand what the proposals might mean on the ground and how it might change the uh, physical attributes of the, the city. And then this was further supplemented through visualizations of the different typologies. So for example, one of the existing spaces in New York and how it might look following intervention. So focusing on sort of community cohesion, biodiversity enhancements, and this would be the, the area within a typical day. And then also within uh, or after, immediately after a cloudburst event, 
And one of the key themes that is kind of picked up on many of these is that the um, physical connections are retained for uh, people to pass through the spaces and enable the city to be resilient in operating, even in uh, cloudburst events. So although the volume of water is there, it's um, sort of stored and managed in a way that allows the city to continue to operate. Uh, within a park type environment, this is illustrating a, an existing lake and then showing how uh, measures within the wider area could create some retention capacity, but again also retaining some physical connection through the space to allow the city to continue to function. Then within a more typical streetscape environment where there's maybe less opportunity for blue-green infrastructure, um, designing the levels within the street so that it can accommodate sort of typical rainfall events as other streets do, but then also um, kind of forming an urban uh, temporary canal where the center of the street forms this retention area, but accesses to properties and footways along the streets are retained. And then on a, a slightly larger scale, I guess you would just see this as a kind of a, a wide swale design um, with a, a central dip and then a designed capacity to accommodate the cloudburst events. And then this I th is a nice visualization, but I think it illustrates how um, parks and open spaces can be designed to accommodate water in ways that still allow the park to function and still allow amenity and recreation but uh, through periods of time can be inundated with wet and dry and I guess equally the habitat benefits and the range of vegetation typologies that can result from this. So for in review of the Copenhagen work they found the main benefits arose from avoided risk costs. So that's from physical damages of cloud burst events, but also the output loss of um, lack of resilience in the city being able to function in uh, the immediate aftermath of those. But then also some benefits in avoided social costs uh, from stress and anxiety of the impacts of flood events on properties and businesses. Um, and then also some incremental, uh, but not as significant benefits on the social value, recreation, aesthetic and habitat as well. So they found that the uh, net present value of the investment was for every dollar invested, there would be a, a $1.8 return on investment to the local area. So that kind of gives confidence that development in the initiative does provide value over and above the kind of physical and immediately visible changes to the quality of environment. In terms of timelines for these projects, the grey bars represent the Copenhagen master plan, the first one that was done, and it's kind of showing a potentially four year development period um, before then rolling out um, design and implementation. But since then, uh, we've looked at ways to reduce that program and now looking at something more like 18 months to two years, um, which is still a fairly long time period, but I think remains important to ensure the level of engagement and cross um, authority liaison uh, development of the technical design and challenging the master plan iterations to ensure that what's being put forward is delivering the most value for money. So just to conclude, from a UK context, um, I think Cloudburst master plans would be um, a welcome initiative to develop and deliver within the UK, um, in some ways as a response to local climate emergency declarations, but also as the relationship between local authorities, water and utilities companies and environment agency, develops, um, they can reduce localised flood risk, um, both the frequency and impact of those. So it's not dealing with kind of river flooding events, but just those short, sharp cloud bursts that can kind of cause un un 
foreseen impacts on city or a local area. And maybe through the devolution into city regions combined authorities that provides opportunity to um, draw down on investment as a result of the, the net present value that's envisaged. And then where cities such as Birmingham, for example, looking to go car free, what opportunities does that provide in terms of the, the freed up space within city centres to develop some retrofit green blue infrastructure that deals with climate adaptation, but also starts to look at um, improvements to walking and cycling, um, development of biodiversity net gain initiatives or rewilding initiatives um, and align with uh, local nature recovery networks through cities as well. Um, I think COP26 in Glasgow will be an interesting one to see what comes out um, in terms of this sort of strategic master planning approach to climate adaptation because that's really where the Copenhagen master plan started back in 2009. So I think with where we are in the UK, there's so many opportunities for this, but just welcome other people's thoughts on how these approaches could be adapted in the UK. But that's all for me. Thank you. That's great. That's really interesting. Thanks very much, um, Ian. That was really good. Um, I should just say it was actually seeing you give a presentation on this. Um, well, I think it was last year, probably, wasn't it? Um, that kind of triggered me to think that it would be a really worthwhile event to put on for this group. So. Thank you for that. Right now, next up is Owen Richards, who's joining us from Australia. I think I've seen that you're here, Owen. If you're, yeah, uh, I am. Oh, you're here. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Right. You should have co-host. So hopefully you'll be able to share your screen as well. All right. You guys got that? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Right, cool. over to you. No worries. Uh, it's a good evening, everyone over there, and a good morning to uh, to myself. Um, so yes, I too am presenting on Sponge City Concepts. I'm the uh, Global Environment Leader from McGregor Coxall, based out of Melbourne, uh, here in Australia. Um, and an adjunct associate professor with Murdoch University uh, in Western Australia. Um, based on my uh, years of experience in sponge city concepts and devising two inventions, one with uh, stormwater management and the other as a tree nurturing system based on blue green infrastructure, which I'll probably uh, pop up later on in this presentation. But um, basically, uh, how did I get involved in Sponge City Concepts? So a bit of background just to liven up your evenings. Um, my wife, Marion, is native Chinese and I'm very privileged to have a wonderful Chinese Australian family here and an amazing extended family of in-laws in China. During my career, I developed several uh, connections at local and provincial government levels. Uh, research institutions and construction companies tied to numerous Sponge City projects. Over four decades since 1979, um, the state of Victoria here in Australia and Jiangsu in China have worked uh, together successfully in a range of sectors, including science, tech, innovation, creative arts, education, and most recently Sponge City uh, program. In 2019, a sister state partnership was formally recognised as ceremony in Nanjing to mark Victoria's and Australia's oldest and most enduring partnership, partnership which has seen a cornerstone of Victoria's Chinese engagement since the establishment four decades ago. Since the inception of a Sponge City program, Victorian expertise, including myself, innovation and technologies provided an input and guidance into exemplar Sponge City projects across China. So Sponge City Concepts, I'm sure you've already heard what they are, but what I'm presenting to you today is from a water engineering perspective. Um, and this is gonna be a bit of a, a journey of education because I don't know how many engineers there are here today, but engineering and water in particular forms a fundamental component of dealing with Sponge City. I'm sure you've seen what Sponge City is all about, but basically it's just replicating uh, a sponge within an urban 
mostly impervious environment. And that's the biggest challenge that we have. Where did this all stem from? So basically it stemmed from the massive amount of, of pollution, uh, polluted waterways, lakes, oceans, and coastlines and significantly depleted water resources. So the, the rivers were all paved over and become dry and all that uh, pollution was transported to the waterways. And also uh, increasing a more prevalent flood risk during severe rainfall. The rapid uh, urbanization of China was seeing a massive change in that environment, but also in resources. The, the advent of urbanization and population growth seen China lay more concrete in three years than the USA did in a century. So to combat this, Chairman Mao proposed in 1952 to borrow some water from the southern part of China, a region rich in water resources. In 2002, actually, China finally started this ambitious project to transfer water supplies across the country through a grid of water highways known as Sehung Sansong, four horizontal and three vertical. In 2014, the south to north diversion was completed considered a high risk and very costly gamble. The project only highlighted the limitations of the central government's ability to manage China's water needs. So in 2015, standing beside Erhai Lake in Yunnan province, President Xi called upon Lu Shui Qingshan, clear waters and green mountains to maintain harmony between man and nature and pursue sustainable development across all of China. This was the start of Sponge Cities. So a massive number of, of uh, programs across China um, to receive enormous amount of, of capital funding. A very new concept, particularly in comparison to USA's low impact development lead, the UK sustainable drainage systems and Australia's water sensitive urban design but there's still significant reliance on conventional grain infrastructure and the conveyance principle of stormwater management. And this is still a major impact. Across many of the early um, Sponge City projects, uh, there's still a massive reliance on that uh, conventional philosophy, uh, conventional drainage infrastructure. You see that uh, many of the connections still occurred into uh, drainage pits and pipes. The reliance on drainage combined with the impacts of agriculture and urbanisation still presents significant challenges, problems and climate risks. This was uh, agreed upon by Sir David Attenborough when I corresponded with him uh, a few years ago and I explained to him uh, that one of the major impacts um, of climate change uh, resulting from population growth is exactly what I'm talking about today. So what are some of the key water environment issues we face when we develop our cities? I'm sure you've seen all these before, but we get increased in pollutant loads, increase in surface water flows, loss of habitat, loss of green space. So this is a Melbourne example. So yes, before European and colonization, was established, uh, it was a very rich biodiverse environment, um, but through urbanization and agriculture, we certainly changed all that. Loss of water sponges. So it's a naturally occurring uh, sequence and terminology. And we've seen that occur across all of China's landscape, Hangzhou, Shanghai, Yibin, but also across the rest of the planet in Tokyo, Dubai. This results in loss of life. And actually, as I documented in a recent book chapter, an average 11 deaths per year from flash flooding in Dubai. It's quite a surprising statistic for a desert climate region consisting of sandy desert plains. So you think of that flash flooding in a desert. We get increased urban heat and a study in Shanghai actually uh, directly correlated impervious surface um, with land surface temperature 
Um, this showed to be a negative correlation with vegetation and water. So among those three factors, impervious surface is the most important and most relevant. So what is the impact of urbanization and imperviousness, including conveyance drainage? Well, we've broken the natural water cycle. So this is how it all looked before man came along, um, a very natural, what we call infiltration process. Um, rainfall was intercepted by vegetation and canopy color. Um, rainfall infiltrated in through the soils, even through clays. Yes, clays are, are a good thing because they act like a sponge and then build up enough hydraulic pressure and push that uh, water further down in through rock fissures, into groundwater. Um, and water actually expresses out through the waterways naturally. It takes a long time to flow through that, those groundwater resources. So what you find is that those, those risks of flooding are significantly reduced and to a point in which um, depression storage fill from soil saturation, then you get what's called excess runoff. What we've done is we've reduced those natural state processes and increased the altered state processes. So we've removed all the vegetation from our planet. We've removed all that pore space from the soil. We've removed all of that, uh, those root zone depths and various root zone depths that uh, take a lot of that moisture away. Um, we've compacted the soils through agriculture, uh, machinery and cattle. We've compacted the soils in an engineered environment to try and mitigate risk of, of soil heaving on infrastructure and, and trying to reduce um, maintenance infrastructure costs. Our reliance on traditional grey infrastructure is impeding these mitigation effects. So why is this? Because we still rely on the fundamental philosophy of drainage. So, what is drainage? Well, drainage is the removal of surface water from a place where it lands. And like myself, generations of civil engineers, I'm an environmental engineer, but still covered a lot of this. Been trained in stormwater design with one objective, to build pipes large enough to drain that water away. And this is where the fundamental issue lies, is that I've been trained by a generation before me, he's trained or she was trained before a generation before them and so forth. And we're seeing this in, in as I said before, still a major number of development projects across the globe where we're still relying on an end of line centralized approach to uh, stormwater runoff. You see here that the magnitude of scale of development in China results in very large centralized solutions. We still fundamentally see age old practices, business as usual, a continual focus on regional or centralized solutions, a focus on fixing these regional centralized solutions, connecting to existing business as usual systems with limited options for retrofit. So I'm not sure you really noticed, but this is a video I took during um, uh, a football game here in Australia, where during a rainfall event of about five to 10 mils, it quite clearly showed the contrast between a porous and impervious surface. So when rainfall occurs on this impervious surface or pavement, it accumulates, channelizes and flows. And because it's flowing, it needs somewhere to go and it's somewhere to be managed. So that's sent through drainage systems to a centralized system. Whereas on your, on your porous surfaces, it sits there, it infiltrates until it becomes a depression storage. At that time when those depression storage is filled, that's where you get connectivity in that surface water flow. Oh, now it's playing. <laughs> so how can we make development to be a driver of environmental improvement? Well, this is through blue-green infrastructure framework. It actually encompasses a triple bottom line uh, sustainability framework of environment, uh, economics, and social or amenity. 
This is taking all those blue infrastructure and the green infrastructure and overlapping and merging together to get living infrastructure. The important aspect in this is that actually living infrastructure means the effective integration of vegetation, soils and water systems. And this is still where a fundamental aspect of, of climate adaptive, climate resilient, living infrastructure systems still fail because we're not getting enough water into the soils to help maintain that healthy environment, to help maintain the oxygen transfer, to help maintain that vertical infiltration process and chemical reactions within the soil, the rich biodiversity, um, the carbon sequestration within that soil profile, resulting in a rich, large biomass, root biomass to help support tree stability um, and urban canopy cover. So what currently makes integrating stormwater so challenging? We're still relying on that end of line conveyance principle. We get these large end of line solutions. We get reduced development areas. As you can see, similar to the UK over here, we call them detention basins. That's where all the focus of stormwater goes. So in 40 mils of rain, you'll actually see this water pond up. You'll see the pollution transported. Whereas if you go out into a paddock, you might not see that same response. Effective living infrastructure requires a paradigm shift in stormwater management philosophy. It's taking sponge city concepts to the next level through what's called source control stormwater management. Source control stormwater management is where we try and manage stormwater at the smallest possible scale. We call it the snowflake principle because I can manage many snowflakes in a small container. I can manage a bit more rainfall in a larger container and so forth, but it's much easier to manage a whole number of small cups rather than this massive, big, costly uh, infrastructure at the bottom of the hill. Also, most significantly, water doesn't flow horizontally through a sponge. So if we're really trying to achieve sponge city concepts, we're trying to mimic those processes of, of vertical flow. This goes back to changing the basics. This is forgetting about conventional infrastructure. This is a new model where the streets copy nature at every scale, from household through to the rivers. In, in China of late, we've been applying this, uh, the source control approach to a, a number of projects where we only utilize drainage as a last resort, as redundancy, as a, as a risk mitigation option. Here's a couple more examples where, again, we're trying to uh, manage that runoff as close to the source of, as practicable. Uh, this, as I explained earlier, has resulted in my uh, second invention called the tree nurturing system. This is uh, a device that harvests rainfall off pervious, uh, impervious surfaces, but actually allows it to infiltrate from vertical um, on the top of the surface, or as close to the surface as practical. What this does is allows rainfall uh, to move through the structural soil cells and generate those same chemical reactions, the same rich soil environment, the same uh, carbon sink, um, and the same healthy um, root biomass. The outcome, it's called biomimicry. It's where we're mimicking those natural processes within these urban environments. At source, Reuse, there's less infrastructure to send it all the way back from those centralized uh, um, systems. Passive irrigation of green streets, we're seeing that, um, that that's a massive contributor to, to mitigating uh, climate change drivers. Naturally refill permanent urban water bodies, park irrigation, manage aquifer for recharge and significantly reduce urban heat island effects. What we get is maximum triple bottom line outcomes.
And in re relation to climate resilience, reducing urban heat island effects, retaining the water, improving water penetration, improving access to and amenity of nature in the city, maintaining ecosystem services and biodiversity in the city's landscape. So that is the ultimate sponge city approach. We end up getting a unique cost-effective solution that as you can see in this diagram, looks very similar to the natural water cycle, but it's within an urban context. So projects that we've been involved with in China specifically, and particularly of late, we've been applying this source control approach to stormwater management and being able to, to manage the flow of water through a, a site to distribute it a lot easier. Um, if we want a permanent water body, then we can create that by, by lining um, our infiltration trenches and sending water somewhere or retaining it within the street, the treat street pits. Uh, Daishan Island, Hangzhou, um, where again, we applied source control, stormwater management, um, but we also need to take on existing infrastructure. So that's actually what we call hybrid drainage connections. We only rely on short links um, to get the uh, stormwater across sections that are too challenging or we can't have um, um, open surfaces to, to take that water up. Another example, uh, Fuxian, um, again, the same philosophy. And what you start to see here is, is more evenly spread blue-green infrastructure across the environment. And in locations where we want more permanent water, more permanent water can be retained. Zhencheng Park, same philosophy again. Um, look, looks very similar to, to the, um, the gardens in, in uh, Singapore. Um, and that's because we've distributed that water more evenly across the sites. End up getting a lot more uh, cooler environment, um, more balanced uh, moisture, soil moisture ratios, um, more healthy and, and rich high amenity environment. Another example, and another example. And I think that's it. Fantastic. <laughs> really interesting. Thanks, Owen. That was um, yeah, great insight there into um, your work and your approach. So thank you very much for that. No worries. Right. We're I think we're we're running slightly over, but um, hopefully people can stick around for a little bit longer and I'll move swiftly on to our final um, presenters. So I don't know, Zach and Roger, if I don't know who's gonna go first or how you're gonna run this, but um, I'll hand over to you. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, oh, my video is not on. Let's turn that on. <clears throat> it's uh, Roger Knoll here uh, in Shepherd City the Council. I'm talking with Buda, who's the Principal Landscape Architect. I work in the Lead Local Flood Authority team in Sheffield Council. Uh, I'm just going to give you bit of an overview of Sheffield and water issues and talk a bit about our suds and some of the activity we've had today and that'll be handing over to Zach to talk about this scheme here which is some of the suds retrofit. Um, so a bit of a different talk to what we've had so far this is from the basics if you like of uh, a city council and what they're trying to do from a suds angle in, in Britain. Zach can I have the next slide please. Uh, I mean, just to talk about the main issue. I think we've lost you, Roger. Can't hear you, I'm afraid. That's a bit dark, isn't it? <laughs> um, okay. 
Um, well, I can take over. I mean, I, in Roger's, I mean, if I, well, I suppose if I just start off with my bit and then if Roger comes back on, he can perhaps pick up I think so. uh, where he very quickly left off, <laughs> if that's all right, Paul. Right, thank you. So, I mean, from my point of view, my name's Zach Tudor, Principal Landscape Architect with Sheffield City Council. And uh, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm basically just cover an overview of stuff. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail about where the, where we've been to and how we've got to these positions, but I was just going to basically give you lots of old photographs of what we've hoped, well, what I I believe we've achieved as, as a really good positive um Sort of background to, to where the city's been and, and and is continuing to go to today really so from my perspective and the wider context about the benefits that our streets and spaces in, in Sheffield or any other town or city in Britain or the, the world I suppose can sort of look at in terms of these multiple functional benefits I mean obviously climate change uh, is one of the, you know one of these key drivers for us um, and you know that obviously includes all the, the climate resilience in terms of hydrological uh, and and dealing with sort of floodwaters, water quality, and all those benefits. Um, the loss of biodiversity and habitats and species is something which you know it's not just about the wild places that are surrounding the cities. You know we need to try to help wherever we can in the streets and spaces in our more urban denser uh, denser areas as well. And just really looking at, you know, the growth of urbanisation is massive. And, you know, we're not seeing, I don't believe, in particularly in Britain, the offset of green infrastructure to match that growth of urbanisation, that denser uh, elements. And, and really, you know, for me as well now, more than ever before, I guess, um, it is very much about, you know, the health and well-being of people as well is, is coming much more to the fore in terms of these sort of um, problems that we're, we're facing in our urban centres. So, um, Roger was going to talk oh, about this slide. I'm here, ah. I'm here again, Zach. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? It cuts out after all that time. Anyway, I'm okay to do, carry on. Do you want on. to go back then, Roger? Uh, uh, no, it's fine. Um, no, hang no, on. no just, just take it back to yours because, yeah. 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 Go right back. Yeah, yeah. All the way. That's it. Yeah. So, I was talking about the flood risk from uh, riv main rivers. Uh, we responded to that with various things. Zach and I did the first investment here on this other photo, which was, you know, defending at Riverside, but trying to be creative with that. I know it is containing the flow, but sometimes that is one of the best options. But here we were trying to be creative, creating access to the river, that sort of thing, pocket parks. So trying to take advantage of the opportunity of putting the defence in and creating positive investments in the riverside environment. Next slide, please, Jack, uh, Zach. I mean, the other thing is about slowing the flow. So we've also got on the table, we have about an 80 million pound programme here. So some of that's already been delivered, but we're also looking at how do you slow the flow? And that is in response to the defences. Defences reduce the floodplain. So you have to counter that with slowing the flow, but this is also slowing the flow generally. So this is adding to the protection of communities. So this is using parks, using fields to store that water. Next slide, please. Yeah. The other thing is the whole catchment. You know, this is the Sheffield catchment, the red boundary here from the uplands of the Peak District right through to the city centre, the urban and the rural and the rural's part of the mix so we have a 40 million pound program for the don a whole on the whole working with all the authorities down the don the sheffield's at the top and we have part of that program to develop natural flood management in the catchment whether it's planting woodland creating wetlands and ponds uh, or improving the the tenure of farms or repairing the peat of the upland so this is part of the mix and we've done analysis of how that can have benefit to those other aspects of the defenses and uh, slowing of the flow in the park. So how this is part of the whole mix. Next slide, please, uh, Zach. Just Sheffield here, this is looking at the urban area. Uh, you know, the big, the dark blue are the main rivers, but we have hundreds of kilometers of watercourses, the lighter blue, the ordinary watercourses, 
and this is part of the picture of Sheffield and how that contributes to the rivers and the flooding, but other problems as well. Sheffield is quite a hilly city. There's not much flat. So I would say that the rivers are the main issue for us. Surface water flood risk is not such a big issue because water finds its way downhill. But we are finding, looking at the, the analysis of the sewers and the drainage networks, that perhaps we're getting to the ceiling of capacity and some overland flow paths are going to have to be addressed in the future as they become active through climate change and increased intensity of rainfall. Next slide, please, Zach. This is just an extract from GIS showing the old combined sewer, the red of the old city, uh, and then from the 60s, 70s, the blue and the separate systems that have been built where we have surface water and foul managed separately. But, you know, we've inherited all sorts of problems here uh, and that, that change in the catchment, how we deal with that. So the red areas that we have combined sewer overflows that are adding to flooding in those big events, but also polluting the water courses. And the surface water systems have all had no control over them. So they're running polluted water off highway networks and uncontrolled into these river systems. So we've got quite a lot of problems that are you know, going to emerge over the future years. And we have this hundreds of kilometres of water courses that are now emerging as part of the infrastructure of the city in terms of surface water. We're using those now more and more to actually connect development into into them so we need to make sure that we're not exacerbating flood risk and dealing with water quality so that the points here are about maximizing the benefit you can get from greenfield and brownfield that redevelopment of the city as we change the city can we disconnect from the combined sewer and get it into water courses can we slow that down and can we treat that water um, but also, I mean, that's been my main area is being dealing with new development and actually trying to promote sustainable drainage and how they approach that. But also it's about seeking opportunities through the redevelopment of the city in whatever form and other investment types and other benefits we can have from a water point of view as part of that investment. And Zach's going to be talking shortly about one of those aspects, highway investment, regeneration investment that can bring water benefits. Next slide, please, Zach. Just to talk a, a few sub schemes here, I mean, this one's been in 20 years now, uh, and this was a classic area of Sheffield, which is redevelopment, difficult areas socially. And we've got a lot of these in Sheffield, and it's taking the opportunity to use water to improve the quality of those open spaces, but also to provide that flood risk, mimicking greenfield runoff rates. Uh, and slowing that down before we put it in the water courses. So this all used to get, these sites all used to go to the combined sewer and be treated, all this rainwater. Now we're taking it into parks, controlling it and putting it into the river system. And I mean, this shows, you know, a, a span of 12 years, it still functions well. It's a very simple scheme uh, and the community love this. And this is part of the emergence in this case of a new district park, which was derelict and has become a real asset to this community. So we've carried that on across the city. We have over a dozen sites like this. Next slide, please, Zach. And this is another one. We've we've actually built a regional scheme. Now I know we, you know these regional schemes are still pipes to ponds, but it's making the best use of what assets you have. And in this case, massive areas of open space that were not functioning well uh, were really rather dull. And this is about taking five development sites and the council leading on regional landscapes that manage water in a series of channels and wetlands to manage uh, probably about nine hectares of development. So the roads and the roofs and controlling that water. And that cascade there is the last release of that water controlled and clean into the water course. And all these features that we're building, we're building in long-term arrangements for management. So this scheme, for example, all the residents that are feed into this are under a, an agreement with the council and they pay the council a sum each year for us to look after these resources. So we maintain the amenity value, the biodiversity and obviously the functionality for water quantity and quality management. Next slide, please, Zach. You know, we're, we're trying our best as well to look at the integration. I mean, this is really what the challenge is for the British housing sector is 
creating space for water within it and the integration and the challenges of doing that. Uh, this one's just gone in. This is using a linear green network and saying, let's make it blue. Let's make it manage all the highway network. Uh, and can we even get the roof water into that as well? Uh, and that, that was, that's a real challenge. But this is creating these green links. And this is the challenge to get these green integrations with housing. It's part of the landscape, but it can be blue as well. So that is something that we're driving forward. Permeable pavement, you can see there as well. And that has taken a few years to get that into the highway contract. So we have a private uh, PFI contract. So that took two years of arguments to get that to a figure that was affordable to maintain. And now we have a number of highways that are using permeable pavement very successfully. And that's about just driving home, the getting rid of the risk, na risk averse nature of managers and actually saying, no, this isn't really a problem. This is a tried and tested method and actually is very robust in managing water. And it's a very robust road. So now we are having these, these permeable roads coming in and they're great because they're providing cleaning and storing of water in a footprint that's gonna to have to happen anyway of a road. So source control uh, is something that, you know, we're building on. And Zach's gonna talk now about greater green, I suppose, and, and stuff within the city center. And I think that's real value in actually the retrofit side of things, providing the experience, the testing of ideas, the management experience, that can be, then be transposed into the private development sector. And we're already now looking at bioretention areas in housing to deal with water quality before discharge to rivers. So I think there's a, a cross fertilization between the retrofit and the, the, the new development sector. So I'm handing over to Zach now to talk about some of the work in the city centre. Okay, thanks, Roger. Um, yeah, so going back to where we were, I think, um, in terms of the original sort of discussion, um, I'm, I am going to be quite quick over most of these because obviously you've <laughs> you've all got your tea to go to, I guess, and everything else. So uh, I will fly through most of these elements. I will touch very briefly on each of the, the benefits, how we're sort of looking at and researching for the universities at the moment, and just sort of try to um, touch on that. But I'm, I mean, they've already been discussed in some form or other through uh, most of the other. Uh, discussions tonight so I won't dwell on most of these things and if somebody wants to come back at the end on on particular bits that's great so most of our thinking really uh, in the city centre space I mean I've been working with Roger now for um, over 20 years on, on some of these early park space projects but really it was 2007 and we had a massive flood event in the city centre hundreds of millions of pounds worth of damage loss of life it was a real sort of change in perception in your mind about, you know, what the city centre um, and the fragility of the city centre spaces is. Um, so that was a big change and step change in our, our perception about what we can do and how can we make our streets and spaces more resilient for the future. Um, and another element which sort of made us sort of stop and think about stuff was that we, in 2008, we built a new ring road, which pushed um, pushed our older ring road further out and freed up opportunities um, like this was the old ring road. Um, it was a pretty much an anywhere space and nowhere place at the same, same time, really. Um, just very functional, dual carriageways, barriers, gully drains, um, big splayed junctions, uh, lots of crossings to get people through the spaces. Just a really alien place for for pedestrians to want to well be within to walk through but even less so to want to sit and dwell within so you know could we come up with a solution which we'd started to look at in terms of our sort of suburb areas and um, where we started to sort of look at sustainable urban drainage principles and could we start to bring this through into bear into our proper city center spaces and really sort of push the boundaries of what a street or a space can be and you know this, I mean, this is what we, this was the second year of, of Greater Green uh, establishment in 2017. This photograph was taken. So the scheme was finished in 2016. Um, this was all part of the dual carriageway network. Um, the central barriers were there, all the gully grates have gone. Uh, Curbs, upstands have been removed. Uh, and the whole thing has just been sort of transformed into something which is much more well, frankly, beautiful, but much more human scale um, and opportunities for people to want to sort of have a much more of a relationship with rather than just 
the dual carriageway pretty well horrific and hostile environment that we did have before so it, it's just you know it was a test case initially to see could we could we achieve something which was truly transformational for our streets and i think a lot of that was done through using research-based urban greening principles a lot of work we did with the university um particularly nigel dunnett um in the early days to sort of just look at you know what can the green elements bring to our spaces and overlaid all of that in terms of a multifunctional, multi beneficial approach to stuff. Um, and this is what we've continued to do throughout our city spaces. Now, this isn't greater green. This is just another quite large, significant place right in the core city centre spaces. But it's again dealing with all the highway, the cycleway, all the hard standing spaces, all the water is treated, held on to, slowly released, used if we can do. Um, with, with irrigation for planting, it's all the planting there is doing all the blue uh, elements that the old gully grates would have done prior to that. Um, so it, it's using that, it's, it is very much about research based urban greening, not just chucking things in and hoping for the best. We, we are really going to town on and, and researching things ourselves constantly as well going forward um, about what is going to work better. And of course, most of these schemes that we've done to date would only happen through uh, investment and that catalyst for change is a huge part of this because most of the funding comes from on the back of the potential for investment so it's that setting for the investment that we're getting the money on the back of um, so it's a it's a critical part of how we start this ball rolling almost in terms of we don't look at it from a suds perspective or a blue a, a green perspective it's all about where can we get the funding from initially to transform these street spaces and the, the greater green corridor itself is 1.3 kilometers at the moment soon to be a little bit longer uh, and you know we, we've got huge investment opportunities over the next couple of years to another two and a half kilometers within our city center spaces to do all this and that's on top of all the new park and green spaces which we're looking at as well but if, if you just look at the opportunities within our historic green uh, in our historic road networks the, you know if you start thinking about even just a third of the space that you have and squashing it all down and giving that to the green and blue the, the, the you know the benefits are huge frankly and also you know it is about place making and, and sheffield has gone down a very specific route with its character and its sort of garden approach to its city center um, making it trying to feel like, like it's more like a garden space or a park space, um, but bringing um, perhaps our sort of our periphery of, of our sort of Pennine landscape that we sit within and um, bringing that and celebrating that into our, our city centre core spaces as well has been a real sort of drive for regeneration and as a landscape led approach to this. So again, this is just a scene which is actually a, a, it's a roof garden over a surface, um, an underground car park. But we we deal with water from the very top we let it we capture it we release it again through pipes into the planting areas then capture it again release it and and slowly you, you can play and enhance and, and celebrate that sort of uh, element of water in our urban spaces and i think you know everybody every town and city at the moment is thinking what on earth are we going to do with our city center high streets and I think you know most people are looking at you know reinventing that neighbourhood approach to stuff, and this really backs up um, the this sort of incentive to why you would want to come and live in the city centres. Um, you know, if you can bring that park, that garden feel to this stuff, it starts to build community and build neighbourhood spirit, and that will attract people to want to come and be within these spaces much more. And the urban biodiversity, it's, you know, it's, it's something we're sort of really, um, it's not all native vegetation. There's a big mix of native and non-native species in all this, trying to extend that sort of pollen and nectar sort of seasons. We do have larval food source plants within that as well. Um, and, but, you know, it, it's just about that balance of, of human and environmental and biodiversity benefits that we can get from this. So it's, it's, it is a, it's a, a difficult balancing act at times but it is something that i think we, we feel quite strongly that we want to achieve something which is high impact for for our city spaces and something that frankly softens the city as well you know blurring those edges between hard environments hard surfaces 
and you know creating that much much softer more attractive environment to want to be within and travel and move through and it's just it is about those sort of there's the much softer element to to a harder city environment and of course as as well as that sort of infrastructural change in terms of blue and green we are massively investing in our active travel the cycle off-road cycle networks and it's again about immersing cyclists in a in a safe green environment that they can meander through these spaces and just again celebrate the fact that you are moving through a lovely bit of almost meadow-like environment uh, you're not part of the road network you're not part of that potential for serious accidents it's just part and parcel of wanting to attract people to come back and and use these city centre spaces in a much more environmental way. Climate change resilience, it's a whole debate in its own site. I mean, we, we've got tons of research, um, which is sort of ongoing, a lot of it in the moment. Um, but all those benefits which we have been looking at in terms of the heat island effect and, and how it's sort of um, been sort of the, the contributing factors to the, the, the green and the structural diverse vegetation. Um, sustainable urban drainage obviously with a flood mitigation and that future proofing for, for climate change resilience into the future but all of these things are, are huge and, and something that's just come up recently has been um, you know we've been looking at the potential of, of capture of microplastics in these systems from the road networks obviously thermoplastic paint um, rubber crumb tire eroding from from vehicle car tires all of that sort of material going into the drains into the rivers into the oceans um, you know, we can try to sort of buffer that and capture that. And at the moment, working with um, with the university to start looking at actual microbial breakdown of some of those plastics. And that's another great bit of research, PhD study, which we're hoping to, to kickstart in the near future, which starts to look, you know, I, I assumed it would just be about capturing these plastic particles, but actually it's now, you know, we're looking at what, what microbial activity could actually start breaking down the plastics as well so it's you know it's an even better element to this which in effect is really just a glorified grass a, a roadside verge um, you know, still functions for pedestrians for cyclists for local access for local bus movements uh, it still does all those things but in, a, in a, just a much more beautiful environment and I think really just a bit of, I suppose, reality check in terms of these benefits are only going to be beneficial to us as a city, to a region, to a, a, a country, to a planet, if we do it on a significantly much bigger scale than we're, we're doing at the moment. So I think, you know, looking at a space like this and then turning into that, which is what we have done in terms of that road junction area, that, you know, we need this level. We can't just be thinking if we do a little bit of, suds planting and suds uh, blue green infrastructural changes along a roadside it's all going to be suddenly you know it's going to be cooling our cities and everything else it's, it's not it's going to have to be on a much much bigger scale than what we're even sort of entertaining and imagining i think at the moment health and well-being i talked about very briefly but just immersion and, and being within these spaces on a daily basis i think you know there's a lot of research again at sheffield university um where they are looking at restorative effects on your you know your mental capacity and stuff of just being within this sort of style of landscaping is you know has as that is a massive benefit to us and again healthy streets getting people active getting people wants to move through these spaces is another really important part of, of, of that sort of health and well-being side of things and really for me one of the things which we're doing um, as part of that well-being I think is trying to inform people about why we are doing this stuff to give them the the opportunity to try to understand better their urban environments and, and be, want to perhaps be part of that process going forward but it's just informing people with small little it's part of an art project we've done there's 40 odd different signs throughout the whole of the the the, um, the, the corridor of greater green which just gives you little snippets of information about how many bathtubs this particular area of of uh, a green and blue area is saving from going into the, the water course or to the uh, down to the treatment works and it's just giving people this information i think is a really crucial part of them being able to understand their urban environments and and how they can then perhaps try to sort of start changing that themselves sustainable urban drainage huge thing we've all talked about it all night um the, the you know these sort of schemes they, they are it's seeing the water as an asset i think is the biggest part of this and not just 
you know, thinking the easy option is to chuck it down a drain and it's all gone. We need to sort of see this as that as that asset and, and reflect nature in this process. You know, it softens the planting, softens all of that structure, but the functionality is 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 all there. But it's given us all these obviously these other much more beneficial elements as well. And you know, with time and age, you know, this is sort of maturing and maturing. This is just last springtime. Um, we're just waiting for this sort of stuff to to kickstart again, really. But you know, it's this successional vegetation seasonality, which we've sort of divorced ourselves from in our in our sort of city centre spaces, is a is a really important part of that mental restoration. I think. Um, just a few sort of snippets of some of the elements we're sort of looking at, but using check dam processes, cells. The storage of water for holding on to it, slowing it down, treating it. Um, but it, it's a massive part of this. But as you can hopefully see, you know, we, we've done this on a really, really quite large scale. And we've had the opportunity to do it because of the, the old ring road being moved out on, on these particular projects. But we've really grasped the bull by the horns on it, really, I think. Um, and, and I suppose, you know, just sort of um, going back to that sort of the watery um, problems of, of where we've sort of came from, I suppose. But it, it, it is, um, it's seen that resilience and I think Roger's already talked about this stuff actually, so um, it's, we don't need to necessarily talk about that, but we've looked at deculverting of watercourses. Again, this is right in our city centre, um, but just again, celebrating water allowing people to get act, active. Uh, this was a, a flood problem area. The culvert was way too low, taking it away, giving the, the local um, population a sort of a new little green space park to be within um, and, and building some flood resilience into that process as well. And very, very quickly, just to very quickly finish on, uh, this was phase two of Greater Green, which we've just completed recently. Again, Tons of road space, which we just don't need any longer um, because we've redirected traffic flows to elsewhere. And just, you know, looking at this was literally just um, six months of from planting this this particular photograph. But again, just looking at how, you know, we can make a pretty gr a grimy northern city into something which is truly quite beautiful and sustainable and celebrating the benefits of immersion with cycling amongst all of these sort of routes. Uh, it's, it's just um, for me, I, I just I love being able to show people what we've achieved, really, because I think it's such a great success for the city. And it's something that I really hope the city sort of continues and, and, and builds on more and more as as, uh, as the years go by. And that's it. Thank you very much. Zach, is it worth just mentioning um, just about, you know, a lot of these areas are taking the water out of the sewers here and taking it to the river? You know, this is it's re-establishing the catchment, if you would like. It's controlling and slowing that flow, and it's yeah. using the opportunity to slow that flow in the features and using uh, we could use the term art of the possible. You know, what can you do in the space that you have? But what we, you've done here is with that space, you've slowed that flow and disconnected that flow, and that's obviously of interest to the wider network of sewers and even to watercourses and slowing those down locally. So I suppose this is an example of, you know, the highest level, what you can do, but these sorts of things can be moved into other environments to deliver incrementally benefits to surface water management generally. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's right, Roger, actually, because, I mean, the Greater Green project, um, we've unplugged, a large percentage of all of that has been unplugged and can go to the watercourses um, now. But we've also allowed for complete infiltration on most of the cells throughout the area. Yeah. So virtually all the water now, other than the massive storm events, is actually heading down into the ground, re replenishing the groundwaters. And it's that ultimate, I suppose, you know, reforming that hydrological cycle almost. And it's the slowest way to get water the back to a water course is through the infiltration way. So yeah, it, it is about that. Um, and it, it's been, and again, that's been another massive success because we have found that virtually no water is actually exiting the system at all, really. It's all naturally infiltrating away and being part of this. And, you know, I think it is, it's just to sort of close very, very quickly, I suppose, is that, it, it, you know, in the last five years of, of Sheffield, we, we've seen the hottest temperatures on record, the joint driest summer on record, the sunniest calendar month, on record and within the last sort of 15 years we've had two 150 plus year storm events uh, rainfall events 
So, you know, if the, the climates are just going crazy, the, you know, the forecast is to be just much more acute than that going forward as, as climate change increases. So this stuff and the resilience of this stuff to accommodate, you know, the hundred year events plus all the climate change as well, and it still doesn't brim over, is, is something which we really need to be looking at for all our, all our towns and cities, really. Thanks very much, Zach. And it was a great to kind of end with your presentation because as lots of the comments have been coming through in the chat, I've been saying it really is quite inspirational. And I know that uh, both UDG was due to have its conference in Sheffield last autumn. And I think the Landscape Institute London branch were hoping to come and have a visit and see some of these schemes in person last summer as well. And obviously um, events being what they are, neither of those things happen, but hopefully in the next year or so, um, both groups can come up to see you and maybe have a walk around and see some of these schemes in the flesh, which would be fantastic. Yep. Everybody's more than welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm aware that I was hoping to do some q and A. It is eight o'clock. So um, I think we probably are pretty much out of time, but for those that have put questions in the chat, don't worry, we will, I'll sort of divvy these up to the various speakers. I know some were generic questions, some were for specific people. We will send these out and get some responses and put those up on the UDG website along with all the presentations, the recording of tonight will be up probably in a couple of weeks time. So keep an eye on that. Um, and, and the UDG newsletter, if you're not signed up to it, sign up to that because it will be in there as soon as that link is live. So without further ado, I'll just say thank you to all our speakers. I know everyone's got to go and put kids to bed, walk dogs, get dinner or get breakfast in Owen's case. Um, so thank you everybody that um, has come along to all our speakers and presenters. It was a packed evening, but I think it was a really, really interesting one. Um, and we will yeah, hopefully see you all again at an event for either Landscape Institute or Urban Design Group in the near future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul.